Welcome to the new sound of online radio. Welcome to the sound of Universal Broadcasting Network. Anywhere. This is your sound. This is the sound of Universal Broadcasting Network at UBNRadio.com. She's passionate about telling stories of amazing women who are rocking the world and empowering women to live, love, and thrive. Here's your host, Katherine Gray. Welcome, everybody. Welcome to Live, Love, Thrive Women's Empowerment Hour, brought to you by 360karma.com. We hope you're visiting us on Facebook and, of course, joining the conversation on our Twitter and our Instagram at My360Karma. I am very excited today to have in a guest from New York. I read about her in O uh, Magazine, Oprah's O Magazine, and I just love what she's doing. We're going to talk about the very important conversation of immigration and immigration reform. Please welcome the founder of Ask Ellis, Manisha McKee. Hi, Manisha. Hi. How are you? I'm good. Thanks for having me. You bet. I'm so happy to have you, and thanks for coming in from New York to be on the show. I'm a big fan of New York. I used to live there. Well, any, yeah. any excuse to get out of the cold. <laughs> <laughs> but the only thing is you did bring that cold with you. It's a little cold here in L.A. today. <laughs> <Sorry>. <laughs> <laughs> I know you don't think it's cold. We think it's freezing. I guess I haven't got, you know, I, I haven't been in New York for probably lived there for a dozen years so I now I'm like a, a spoiled, a spoiled LA person the weather <laughs> is always perfect here um, but welcome to LA and uh, welcome to the Live Love Thrive show um, I read about you in Oprah's O magazine and uh, reached out and we connected and I said hey I love what you're doing uh, which is your ask Ellis uh, com yes yeah and uh, I want to talk about that why you created a site for immigrants uh, a portal specifically for them to be able to find information and vetted attorneys um, that they could trust to help them with the process of becoming a citizen uh, but first I want to talk about your uh, struggle and your road to becoming a citizen here in the United States, which is just coming up next year. You're going to finally be a citizen yes. after <laughs> after 19 <laughs> years. Yep. 19 years. I mean, this is ridiculous. You're a legitimate you, a person working here, a student. And, and we're going to talk about um, how this immigration needs to be reformed and what the pitfalls are and how most immigrants in this country are here legally, but it's just so cumbersome to get through the system. And how most people are not advocating for open borders, but that we have checks and balances in place for people legally seeking asylum or here as a legal immigrant. And so there's so many facets of this for us to talk about. Um, so I'm glad you're being an advocate about it. Now, I know you came here 19 years ago, but you had lived in many countries, right? Five countries to be yeah. exact? Yeah. And I want to talk about your journey to getting here. And you were explaining to me that you were born in Paris, France. Mm -hmm. But your dad was an, uh, there as an... Uh, Indian diplomat. A, a diplomat yeah. uh, from India. And so... I, uh, I'm actually learning a lot from you in that uh, I, I thought because you were born there that you would have citizenship there, but you were explaining to me uh, it's not the same as in the United States. So here in the United States, if you're born here, you're a citizen. Uh, but in other countries, some other countries like France, uh, that's not necessarily the case. So you actually became a citizen of where your parents were from, which was India, right? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So the, Just the US, to follow that yeah, story. The U.S. is one of maybe 30-something countries that grants citizenship upon birth. Mm -hmm. um, most of the rest of the world, especially Europe, it's, it's very mm -hmm. hard to get citizenship. So I guess that's like the one good thing <laughs> the United States has going for immigration is if you're born here, you're a citizen. I, I guess that's a good thing. Yeah. Sure. Yeah, I, I guess. Yeah. Um, I, don't, I don't know. It doesn't seem like it could be a bad thing, except that the issue of the parents then not being citizens and, and that's a whole nother 
you know. That is a very long conversation. That is a very <laughs> long. We don't have enough time. Yeah, we don't. So what countries did you live in before you came here? Yeah, so I um, I grew up in South Korea, Belgium, wow. Switzerland, uh, a few years in India as well, which is where I'm originally from. Um, Ivory Coast in West Africa. Mm-hmm. Um, and then I came here when I was 18 for college. Wow. Um, uh, that's a lot of places. And you speak several <laughs> languages? I do. Yeah. I do. Yeah. yeah. So, you know, but we want to attract people like yourself to the United States, people that are smart, driven, uh, b- you know, multilingual. Um, and, you know, you were explaining to me that we're losing out on a lot of talent because we make it so difficult for people from other countries to come here and get citizenship. And let's talk a little bit about that, because I think a lot of people don't even know what you've been through. Like when you came here as a student, you you were explaining to me that you always had to have a job that would sponsor you or keep you here. And let's talk a little bit about that. Yeah, I mean, you know, these 19 years that I've been here have been very stressful. The mm-hmm. immigration system here is incredibly complex it's very antiquated and you know it's you come here as a student on a student visa Mm -hmm. and then when you graduate you know the only way to stay you're awarded well in most cases a year of uh, practical training that allows you to work now after that you're entirely dependent on an employer sponsoring you for a work visa and and typically that's the h1b visa that you hear about Um, and now not every employer is willing to do that Um, and you know the the process has only gotten more challenging since I came here when I came here you know things have gone even worse since 2004 you know currently it's they every year about 85,000 H-1B visas are awarded and there is far more applications that they receive and so it's now done with a lottery system so my gosh you know they're receiving two three hundred thousand applications and they only have 85,000. Wow. And so if you don't get chosen in the lottery, even if you have a willing employer, they may not be able to hire you. So, you know, it, it creates unnecessary burden on the employer as well. And then employers aren't as, they, 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 they need the talent, but mm-hmm. if it's such a cumbersome process and they're, they're not sure if the person they want to hire, they'll be able to hire, then they may choose not to do so. Right, it gives um, it another obstacle. Yeah, another and, I, and, and, and I think, you know, we all lose the, yes. the immigrant who'd like to stay here and contribute. You know, we bring people to Harvard and Stanford, and we educate them at the best and the brightest, and then we don't really give them the opportunity to stay. A lot of international students end up leaving, um, and you know, I have friends that did stay for some time, but the path to citizenship was just so cumbersome. They decided to go to other countries, the United Kingdom, back to their home countries, and con- they're contributing to you know. They've started businesses. They're contributing to other places. So, so we do lose out for sure. And as of late, I'm hearing a lot more um, folks going to Canada and interest in Canada. And you even mentioned a friend that uh, like still has a lease here in LA, but had to leave the country and is hoping to oh, so come that's back. Oh, so that's actually a client that um, Ask Ellis has been working with. One of our lawyers was trying to find a solution. Um, this is a, it's an unfortunate situation, but it's 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 quite common. Um, this person was here on a work visa for many years, five, six years. Mm-hmm. It was a routine extension. It was abruptly denied. And, and when you're abruptly denied, there's really not much time. You have to kind of wrap and, up and affairs and And what's a reason leave. that someone would be denied so that we explain to people how uh, how messed up the system is? Like, um, it, They might be denied because they either – believe they don't have the skills for the job, which they had approved, fi- you know, before, um, or, or some technicality sometimes. But honestly. it's not like they've committed a crime or something like, no. Yeah. I mean, this is the way people are painted, you know, is that I mean, it, it could have happened to me, it could have happened yeah. to anybody. It could have happened. To anybody, right. right. Um, and, and this was not common several yeah. years ago. Yeah. Um, right. With the new administration, I'd say an already an already broken system has gone even worse. Right. Right, so right. routine extensions um, were not being denied at this level. Well, I mean, the level of conversation out there on television now is just so unbelievable about painting immigrants as bad people. Um, and and like you said, the majority of immigrants are here legally. Uh, they're going through the system, which is very cumbersome. 
Um, and it's keeping and deterring really smart, um, hardworking people uh, from coming here or staying here. And like you said, uh, it doesn't make any sense for us to educate people at our universities and then not offer them jobs to stay here and, and, and become citizens. We're losing all that talent to, like you said, Canada or you know other different um, countries. And it, it makes no sense. Um, the average person that is born here, I think, just has no concept of what it entails uh, to be an immigrant, uh, a legal immigrant coming into the country, or one seeking asylum, which, as you had, uh, and I had talked about yesterday, um, is a legal thing. It's legal to yes. seek asylum when you're coming from a country where your life is endangered. Yeah, well, yeah. And, you know, there are processes in place for everything, right? Yes. So when someone presents themselves at the border, and says they have a fear of going back to their home country, um, you know, they are uh, put into expedited removal proceedings, but they undergo a credible fear interview. And that's their chance to kind of express um, and give their testimony as to what this fear is. And so it's written into the law mm -hmm. that if you have had past persecution or fear future persecu persecution based on certain criteria, and there are five criteria based on your race, religion, uh, political opinion, um, belonging to a particular social group. Um, and the particular social group, um, you know, that's actually written into the law, but the how it's been interpreted has changed over time. Mm -hmm. So, for example, if you look at past cases, um, you know, uh, if you feel persecution because you are lesbian or gay, we have granted asylum for those mm -hmm. reasons. Um, in recent years, we've granted asylum uh, uh, to uh, to women who might have fear of experiencing fe uh, female genital mutilation or domestic violence. But um, the current administration is actually recently trying to roll that back and has directed asylum officers to assess those claims differently. Um, and, you know, of course, the ACLU is on it. They're being taken to court over it. Mm -hmm. um, so... It's not when someone comes to seek asylum. It's a, they, they have the right to seek asylum. Right. They have to go through a process. Right. And then if they don't, right. uh, if that process does not end favorably for them, then they do get deported. Mm -hmm. Right. So mm -hmm. there is a process in place. Nobody is advocating for open borders. Right. Um, it, it's just that there are many laws that were put into place many years ago that no longer make sense. Right. right. Like many things. Uh, things change over the decades. and. Yeah. What was good 100 years ago is not necessarily good today. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, one thing I want to say is that there is so much talk of undocumented immigrants and illegal immigration, um, you know, as if that's flooding the country. But just to have some perspective, right, uh, 75 to 80 percent of the foreign born population in the U.S. is here legally. Mm -hmm. Right. And the number of undocumented immigrants that are here, um, if you look at. 2016, as President Obama was leaving office, the number of unauthorized immigrants in the U.S. was at its lowest level it had been in a decade. And that's still about, you know, 10.67 million people. Um, and the majority of these people have been here for a decade or longer. If you look at recent arrivals, um, unauthorized immigrants that have come in the last, in, in five years, in the most recent five years, um, those numbers, a lot of them have come uh legally and then overstayed their visas. And so, mm -hmm. you know, we, we really need to reframe this conversation differently. Absolutely. And that's why I'm having you on today. I want to yeah. reframe it. I yeah. want to have the conversation because, like I said, so many people that are born here that never have to go through the system, they don't even understand it. And uh, ignorance is just such a uh, scary thing. And, and so we need to educate people. So I love what you're doing. You have uh, developed uh, askellis.com for people to have a portal. You realized, uh, being an immigrant, that there wasn't a portal specifically for finding legitimate information, legitimate attorneys that have been vetted to help people through the immigration process. So I think what you're doing is really important. Um, so tell me a little bit more about that and what kind of support you need for it for people listening that might want to either use it or might want to support you in a, as a sponsor. Sure. Um, so, so ask Alice for those who don't know us. Um, 
is a platform that helps uh, both individuals and businesses mm -hmm. connect with experienced immigration attorneys. Um, the majority of our attorneys have 10 or more years of specialized immigration experience. Um, and the other thing we do is that um, for those that are not necessarily looking for a lawyer, perhaps they're taking care of their paperwork themselves, mm -hmm. um, or they just need some ad hoc information, we have a lot of content that is crafted by immigration experts and attorneys. Mm -hmm. um, one of the things I noticed when I went through the process was that it was really challenging to find both reliable attorneys, but also accurate information. There was, mm -hmm. you know, immigration was sparse and a lot of uh, information wasn't accurate. The government sides are really hard to decipher. They're not mm -hmm. really written for the average human. Right. Um, and so, you know, Based on my personal experience, it, the, the site was really designed to be simple mm -hmm. um, so that people could easily find the information that they needed and connect with an attorney quickly right? Um, and feel confident in the, in the help that they were receiving. And you mentioned even they could get a free consultation uh, to get the process started so they kind of can get all their ducks in a row and the information they need to, to start the process. Yeah, and, um, yeah. you know, we don't... We don't set how attorneys work, but you know, many of our attorneys choose to opt into our free 15-minute consult. Right. Um, and you know, it, we're very transparent. So if an attorney is going to charge you for a consult, that will be communicated to you. It's on their profile. Mm -hmm. You know what their rates are, if they offer the free consult, if they don't, what they specialize in, mm -hmm. you know, what their background is. About um, how many attorneys are affiliated with it now? Yeah. So. Officially, we started with New York, and we have 20-plus attorneys in New York. But unofficially, if someone reached out to us and said they needed an attorney in San Francisco or Chicago, um, you know, our informal network there, we have... You vet that. Yeah. We have many relationships. Um, we just haven't added them to the platform yet. We've been mostly focused on New York. Right. Um, and one thing I'd like to add is that immigration law is federal, so... Your attorney, mm -hmm. unlike other areas of law, your mm -hmm. attorney doesn't have to be in your in your city or state. So, for example, you want to sponsor your spouse. Um, you live in New York. Your attorney can be in California if you're comfortable working remotely, which in this day and age, many people are. Oh, so wherever they are in the country, they could deal with an attorney that's in New York. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and that's why we've kind of kept the focus on New York. Um, we've helped folks, you know, outside the country as well that are mm -hmm. looking to come to the U.S. And right. uh, the only caveat to that, I would say, is if you're dealing with removal and deportation and have court hearings, it's better to have an attorney that's local mm -hmm. so they can accompany you to, to court hearings. Right. Um, but outside of that. Yeah. And you were telling me that um, when you have a job, let's say you uh, are seeking uh, citizenship and you lose a job, you only have a short window to find another job and another sponsor. It's like 60 days. Yeah. So let me just take a step back. Um, the way you get to citizenship, you first have to get to a green card. And currently there are, just, there are a few ways to get to the green card. And the most common ways are either through, you know, through marriage mm -hmm. um, or through employment. Right. Um, so I went the employment route. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, you start out with the work visa and then your employer has to agree to sponsor you for your green card. Mm -hmm. and, and not every company will do that. No. And right. some companies, you know, you work for them, they have criteria, work for us for two years and then we'll start your process. Right. And I remember one really important thing that you said to me and I didn't want to forget to talk about it was that you often in this in these positions have to take a job with a company you might not necessarily uh, it wouldn't be your first choice or your first choice in job but if you want to stay in the country sometimes you have to give up what you really want to be doing or should be doing for something maybe not just to stay in the country and that's not right either you know I was thinking that was really a big compromise that somebody might have to make yeah look so I yeah. will say that you know, you, you got to do what you got to do. Yeah. Being here, you know, I'm I, I, I it is a privilege and I'm very appreciative to be here. But you, you do have to make some compromises with your career because, you know, the work visas have to be related to the field that you studied. Right. Um, and they're not available not a, in, in every industry. They're not every not every industry qualifies for it and not every employer wants to do it. So, you know, it was it's and, limited and you kind yeah. of come to know these things as you go through the process, that if you want to work in marketing, 
it's going to be very challenging to find a company to to do your to do your work visa. So you're better off pursuing careers in finance, consulting, IT, because those are both more likely yeah. employers and also positions more likely to qualify for for the work visa. Right. And so you know you you know you do what you have to do. But I, I find that a sad situation. Like, what if my heart and soul I really wanted to be doing marketing, but I go and do finance because that's what I got to do to become a U.S. citizen. You know, it, it seems like a not only I'm a big believer in do what your gifts are, you know, what makes you passionate, what makes yeah. your heart sing. And I think that's not fair uh, that because you're here seeking to be a citizen um, that you have to compromise that. I'm just yeah. you well, know, blown and, away by that. Well, and honestly, if it didn't take so long, it would be fine. Yeah. Right. Um, you know, we all have to. Yeah, but for 19 choice. years. You're right. Yeah, yeah. Um, so and what is the average that people wait? Like, I know you're 19 years and we'll talk about that. But is that the average or is yeah, that? So let's talk about timelines as well. Um, well, first of all, the timeline that timelines were always really lengthy. They've gotten worse with this administration. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I applied to naturalize to become a U.S. citizen um, this year in February. And you know, if this had been a few years ago, I would have already been a citizen. It used to take six, seven months. Right, right. It's now taking 12 to 14 months. So everything has gone even slower and it was already slow to begin with. Right. Um, and everyone's path might be slightly different. For me, 19 years is four years of being a student and then working in multiple companies. Um, uh, also where you're from matters. So if you are born in India or China, your path is going to be decades longer than somebody else. Are you kidding? Yeah, so. Why? Um, there are limits as to how many green cards can be issued. Oh, uh, from those countries. From, no, not from those countries. Yeah. Uh, there is a maximum limit for any country. And there are, as there are more people from India and China applying for green cards. Oh. And this was created back, this law was created back in the day to actually reverse some discrimination that was happening. So at the time it was created, certain countries were not allowed to um, come, you know, citizens of certain countries were not allowed to come to the US. And so at the time that this law was created, it was created to be more fair, that, you know, everyone's allowed right. and we will cap each country no more than X percent from every country. So at that time it made sense. Right. Now, but what's happened is that, you know, if you have had a lot more Indian and, and Chinese people Applying, it's resulted in enormous backlogs, oh, and so wow. there are people who. Won't so someone could come from Canada and go through it more quickly than someone from India. Potent, yes, potentially, yes. yeah. Um, but again, you're coming here, let's say, on a work visa. Your employer might say, "Okay, two years before I'll start your process," and then they do start your process. Now, how skilled you are also matters where you're in the process. If you have a master's degree and the job required an advanced degree, puts you in a different bucket. If you have a bachelor's degree and you're a little less, it's a different bucket. So there's so many permutations on how long it might take. But it can take three to five years as well if you come, if you skip the college part and you come here after. Mm -hmm. um, but generally speaking, people are waiting a very long time when they're coming to the U.S. through employment. Right. Um, when you marry a U.S. citizen, it's different. It's, it's faster. A little bit expedited, yeah. but not automatic. Not automatic. Right. You, there's still a process. You have to apply. There's paperwork right. to be to be filed and, and money to be paid to the government and right. Yeah. So um, we are going to wrap up, and I just want to know uh, what would you like to tell people that you think is the solution to this immigration problem. I mean, not that that's an, I know that's not a two minute answer. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no. But you know, I'd love for your input since this is your passion and you're doing something that's creating a solution to help people that are immigrants. So what is your what is your vision of the ideal situation or solution? Yeah, no, this is a long conversation, but what, let's let's let me say this. Um, I think we're having the wrong debate. Uh, policymakers really need to start having a discussion around our aging workforce and what a balanced approach to recruiting talent looks like across uh, across the skill spectrum, right? We have, if you look at the Bureau of Labor Statistics, we have, I think, 4.5 million job openings in the U.S. right now, right? So we keep talking about immigrants stealing jobs, but we have 4.5 million job openings that require a variety of skills, maybe not just 
high skilled, but also a different category of skilled. We routinely hear about shortages for agricultural workers and physician shortages in rural parts of the U.S. So we really need an immigration policy that's responsive to our labor needs. So yes, we need to that makes perfect sense. right. So yeah. we need to start by looking at what are our labor needs. Right. There's a glaring disconnect right now between the immigration system and our economic needs. Um, you know, immigration's. You know, I'll say it, it's not a zero sum game. Um, if done right, everybody actually wins. And so we need to do it right. We need to take a look at what are our labor needs? How do we fill them? Um, where are their gaps? Fill them with immigrant talent that is here and wants to come here and wants to contribute. Right. Um, and then as far as the aging workforce, you know, since 1965, immigration has been the primary driver of our population growth, right? And now baby boomers are getting older, fertility rates are declining, and, you know, any time a country's population starts to skew older, that is cause for concern, um, you know, because your, your labor force will start shrinking. So we want to bring in younger immigrants into the workforce to f- serve that need? We, we kind of will need them. So by, twi- will. by 2050, I think the estimate I saw is 22 percent of the U.S. population will be over 65. Right. Now, with that comes greater health care needs. And currently, right. I think it's One in four dentists, one in five pharmacists, and almost one in three physicians are foreign-born. So to shut foreign-born talent out is only going to hurt us. Hurt the healthcare system and everything. Right. As we as this country gets older, you know, we need to look at how how immigration can support that. Right. Right. And 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 put a positive end to this. D- debate and, and and instead of putting a, a negative on immigrants, to look at it in a positive light of bringing talent and good people into our country to help be the great America that we are, which is a melting pot of people from all these yeah. different countries, which is how America became in the first place. Yeah, and yeah. and you know that's been my experience. America yeah. has been wonderful to me. Yeah, um, and most immigrants that come here. Um, are very happy to be here, feel privileged to be here, and, and want to contribute. And and do. Right, and yeah. absolutely, and they do. Yeah. yeah. Thank you so much. Sure. I love having you here. I love talking about this and educating people about it. And I love what you're doing with AskEllis.com. I hope if someone's listening uh, that needs immigration services or has a friend who might need it, yeah. that they will pass it along. Absolutely. Keep doing the great work. Thank you. Always takes women. (laughs) Uh, Thank you for tuning in. We'll see you next week. We appreciate it. Hugs and happiness.